welcome everyone to the third in the series of Morgan County Bicentennial 2020 Lectures. Uh, let me thank all of our sponsors and funders for the Bicentennial, Morgan County Commission, Museum of the Berkeley Springs, which is producing these lectures, uh, Travel Berkeley Springs, the West Virginia Humanities Foundation, the Foundation for Art, Science, and Technology, which is FAST, um, and hmm, I think that's it for funders. Uh, Citizens National Bank did fund the birthday party in February, and they also have printed up Daniel Morgan $200 bills that you can pick up at the bank. So we're really grateful to all of our funders who have made this happen. I also want to thank the incredible technical crew here today uh, that really have gone the extra mile. And Lori Hansroth, who is the uh, administrator of the museum and also part of the Bicentennial team, along with me and Stephanie Alamang, um, Bob and Jennifer Peake, who are doing all of our filming, Charmaine Sharon, who is handling the live stream, uh, Jack Sornan, who was our stage manager and made all this happen, and thanks very much to the Star Theater for allowing us to use the space to do this lecture. Uh, so, let's see, I think that's all my thanks I have to do. I'm Jean Mosier, president of the Museum of the Berkeley Springs, and as I said, on the Bicentennial Committee. Uh, today, we're going to have the excellent opportunity of listening to Steve French talk about the Civil War in Morgan County. And Steve is the author of four books, which you will be able to purchase after the lecture. Uh, he is a historian. He is a former Berkeley County educator. And he likes to relate history in stories. So this will be great fun to uh, listen to. Uh, if you've got this week's Morgan Messenger, Steve wrote an article in there about the Civil War in Morgan County, so you could get a little taste of what's happening. So, with no further ado, let me turn it over to Steve French. Uh, we're going to talk about Morgan County and the Civil War. It's um, an area that's outside the scopes of the big campaigns and battles, but a lot went on here. As you can see now on the screen, it's a, uh, a drawing done by Morgan County native uh, Danny Johnson, and it represents uh, Stonewall Jackson coming through here through Morgan County in January 1862. Okay, we're going to talk, this is uh, about uh, what was going on right at the beginning of the war now, or as the war was starting, this is a map drawn by a uh, Union uh, captain early in, in the war, maybe the first military map of Morgan County. And as you can see, it's going to point out the Warren Springs Road, the Morgan Frederick Turnpike, the railroad, the importance of the railroad, Bath or Berkeley Springs, and so on. But Morgan County, like the other uh, counties in the foothills of that, the Appalachians, very rugged county. It's, at that time, uh, uh, you know, you have uh, the foothills of the Appalachians, plus you have these small valleys where you can have some farming and along the Potomac some farming, but it's a rugged place. And in 1860, approximately 3,800 people lived in Morgan County, and that included uh, 118 uh, African-Americans. There were 24 African-Americans who were free and 100 or 94 uh, that were enslaved in, in one form or another. But this was not an area where you were go going to have large farms producing big cash crops. Um, 
In the election of 1860, John Breckinridge, the uh, vice president at that time, John Breckinridge, uh, won uh, Morgan County by a large margin. Abraham Lincoln had three votes in the whole county. So he wasn't too popular in Virginia, even here. So what happens? April, April 12th, 1861, the Confederates fired on Fort Sumter, which, you know, in my opinion, was a big mistake. They should have waited a little longer and see what, could, so they could see what was going to play out. But by the 17th, um, Abraham Lincoln had called for the, uh, each state to send in troops for national service. Virginia, I believe, it's, it was supposed to send in about 5,200 troops. Governor Letcher, though, rejected this. It said he would not send troops to march against the cotton states. And um, the secession convention then voted uh, to leave the Union quickly. Militias from Virginia would capture Harper's Ferry in uh, Nor uh, Norfolk, the naval yards there. And uh, the militias would be called up. Now, county, each county had militias of everyone between 18, and every man between 18 and 45. And these uh, militias, in most cases, were going to report. But when you get to these border counties, like Berkeley County and uh, Hampshire, and also Morgan, uh, not many, a lot of men didn't want to come in and serve against the United States government. So in Morgan County, four of the militias did not show up at all. And other men that were part of the other three militias didn't either. So you didn't have a full complement of troops. What did these men do? Well, when the Confederates would be around, they would hightail it from Maryland or hightail, go into hiding somewhere. Many, like my uh, great-great-grandfather Noah Potter, went to Maryland and he uh, joined uh, Maryland forces there. He joined the Potomac Home, Second for, uh, Maryland Potomac Home Brigade. So in the beginning of the war, or right when it was starting, you had these militias being called up, and this is going to cause a lot of anger between the people in these these border counties, especially Morgan. Now, on the 23rd of May, 1861, then you would have the uh, vote among the uh, voters of Virginia, all men at that time, whether or not Virginia would leave the Union. And of course, Virginia uh, voters chose that, but in Morgan County, the vote was 583 to stay in the Union and 186 to leave. So you have about a six to one or a five to one split that favored the Union here in Berkeley and Morgan County. Berkeley, similar, 1,303 would uh, vote to stay in the Union and 508 against. As you go to Jefferson, it's almost flipped as the Confederates there vote to leave the Union. Okay, next. Okay, we'll go just a few seconds to some of the individuals that are connected with uh, Morgan County in the Civil War. This is David Hunter Strother, uh, known by his pen name also as Port Crayon. He is a famous man before the Civil War as an illustrator, an author, travel writer, maybe the top travel writer in the United States at that time, or maybe uh, or in the top five. But uh, he lives in Martinsburg, but he's connected with the, his father here in the, this Berkeley Springs Hotel, and they, he has a home here and a family. He is a member of what was called the First Families of Virginia. And these families, men from these families, were expected to go into the Confederate Army. This is, these, he is an aristocrat, and he would tell you if he was here today, he would tell you he's one. He becomes one of the most hated men in Virginia, as far as the Confederates were concerned. And if the Confederates get word that he is in uh, Berkeley Springs visiting his wife and daughter, or, uh, they're, they're going to try to catch him, as you'll see later. Other men that are really involved in Morgan County on the 
Confederate side are Trip O'Farrell, who at 17 was elected to the uh, clerk of the county court here. He is going to leave and join Confederate forces and become well known as a raider. Uh, later on, he's not going to be able to come back to Morgan County because of charges of horse stealing, and he will go on to become the governor of West Virginia, or uh, governor of Virginia in later life. Okay, George Hunter, another old Berkeley Springs name, also is an important Confederate raider. Okay, next. Now, what is the importance of Morgan County as far as the war is concerned? For both sides, it's a railroad, keeping the railroad open. In Morgan County, you had railroad bridges at Cherry Run, Sleepy Creek, uh, Great Kikapin, the large one at Great Kikapin, and also a number of culverts, and then a big tunnel through Paul Paul Ridge. Also, besides keeping that railroad open, and, and the first, first uh, uh, bridges will be destroyed in Morgan County on June 13th, the, the big bridge at Cape, uh, Great Kikapin is destroyed by the Confederates, and then on the 25th, uh, the smaller one at Cherry Run is uh, uh, put to the torch. These bridges could be rebuilt fast by trestling, but that also made them not um, a lot easier to take down by the Confederates, but also they were, uh, could be destroyed by f floods very easy or high water. Um, what else? Smuggling. 220 square, mile, 220 square miles in Morgan County, much of it very rugged. A lot of fords across the Potomac that smugglers bringing uh, medicines to the uh, Confederate states, smugglers going the other way, bringing uh, uh, tobacco, horse stealing. Horses uh, brought out of Pennsylvania, uh, stolen in Pennsylvania, passing through here, and also ho horses stolen from Union, uh, uh, Union uh, sympathizers here. So that's, it, as far as Morgan County concerned, it's going to be the railroad and this smuggling and horse stealing that's going on throughout the war. Next. Okay, 1862. Coming up to that, and this is a, a, a um, year that's going to have a lot of action in this county. Starting uh, in uh, Romney, really, on October the 26th, uh, Union forces under Benjamin Kelly will attack Romney and capture it from the Confederates under Colonel Angus McDonald and chase him out of, completely out of Romney. Why was this important to Morgan County? Well, it will lead to Stonewall Jackson's Bath Romney campaign. He is in Winchester with what's called the Stonewall Brigade and some militia. And when he sees that Romney has fallen, he comes up with a plan to take Romney back and also maybe move against Cumberland. The, um, General will ask the War Department to send for more troops, to give him more troops, and he will, the War Department will send him three brigades of what's called the uh, Army of the Northwest, led by General William Loring, and um, they will march to uh, uh, Winchester during December. At the same time, Jackson is down around dam number five near Hedgesville trying to destroy that dam and interrupt traffic on the CNO Canal. The, the, for the most part, the railroad in this section now is uh, just destroyed. The ridges are down and the railroad is not going. Next. Now, on January the 1st, 1862, Jackson will, leave, will uh, march out of uh, Winchester with uh, his army. It is a very nice day, very hot. Most of the men will take off their jackets and, and overcoats and stuff and, and, and uh, throw them in the wagon train. But by evening, the temperatures go down, cold winds start blowing in from the west, and snow and sleet starts. And this, this is uh, 
picture here represents this march into Morgan County. By the 3rd or by the 2nd of January, the Army has arrived with an, at Unger's Crossroads in their, in their Unger stores and they're organ, organ, reorganizing there. But they're under this you know, constant cold and wet. A lot of Loring's men are from Tennessee, Georgia, and places in the south, and they don't want to be here at all. They'd rather be back in their camps up in the Allegheny Mountains. He is joined at Unger's Crossroads by troops from Martinsburg, militia troops from Martinsburg, militia troops from the Shenandoah Valley. So his idea is to march with these 8,500 men, take Berkeley Springs, where there's a federal outpost, take Hancock, and then turn and head back to Romney and kick Kelly's troops out of there. So he's coming this way to, to clear what would be his left flank. On the 3rd, they start marching from uh, Unger. They will, uh, after passing through Oakland, he will send the militia, large contingent of Virginia militia, on a by road. They will go to Cold Run Valley. The idea there is for, to march through Cold Run Valley and stop any retreat coming uh, to, uh, from out of Berkeley to Sir John's Run. He will continue marching that day, very cold, very wet, snowing. There'll be a little skirmish, probably out on Route, Route 13, about three miles from here at night, but he bogs down. And uh, once again, the weather is terrible. Next. Okay, this picture shows Union cannoneers defending Warm Springs Ridge. Now the fighting will start on the afternoon of the 4th. Prior to this, a uh, uh, African American from, uh, uh, from somewhere along the Morgan Frederick Turnpike has come in town to tell the Union soldiers that Jackson is on the way. Of course, they did that the day before. And then from the Hedgesville area, one of my ancestors named Teeter French and a guy named Harley Miller they drove up here quickly to tell the uh, federal officers that, the Yank, uh, that uh, Turner Ashby and Jackson's cavalry were on the way. But this fight's going to take place on the evening of the 4th. Jackson's going to be one of the first ones to ride in town. The, although there are two regiments here, the 39th Illinois and the uh, 84th Pennsylvania, they don't put up that much of a fight. Part of them will retreat towards Sir John's Run where they will get across the river and many of them march back down uh, following the canal to Hancock and other troops. Jackson will send other troops under Albert Rust, Rust to uh, Great Cacapin to burn that bridge and they will do that the next day. And he will follow, follow to the heights above Hancock. Jackson and and most of Loring's troops will follow towards Hancock. Next. Okay, this is showing Union troops escaping to Hancock that night. They are going to get there and uh, take position uh, throughout the town. A little cross, cross river cannonading that night, but not much. The next morning, Jackson is is on the West Virginia, now West, West Virginia side of Hancock and uh, ready to shell the town. He'll send Turner Ashby over. He will meet with uh, General Frederick Lander. Uh, we'll talk about him a little bit later and offer terms of surrender. Lander refuses, refuses it in a profane field uh, exclamation. But then, uh, then he tells uh, Ashby, uh, you know, General, you and, uh, or Colonel, you and uh, General Jackson uh, are gentlemen, but you're in a damn bad cause. And then he invites him to leave. That will start on the 5th, a cross river artillery duel. Not too much skirmishing with the men. But by the 6th, and remember it's been snowing and it's very cold all this time, by the 6th, Jackson decides to pull out march back towards Unger Crossroads and reorganize. Next. 
This is a drawing showing that, or a print showing that. He's going to leave on the 6th, start arriving in Unger Crossroads probably by the 7th. But it is terrible, very icy, very snowy. Lots of men are injured. Uh, horses especially are injured in this retreat. Jackson even gets down and helps move some of the cannons. So what comes out of this? He will continue on after about a five-day break where he reorganizes the army, fires some of his officers who he's not uh, uh, too fond of how, how they uh, operated during this campaign, and he has to send hundreds of sick men back to hospitals in hey, uh, Winchester and Martinsburg. The, the article I wrote for the Messenger this week, one of the uh, soldiers from Georgia estimated that the Army had about a little over 8,000 men, but by the time everyone was sent back to hospital or stragglers and so on, they, had, they were down to about 6,000. So he will move on and uh, continue the campaign, which really, it did drive the Federals out for a while, but, but not very long. Okay, this is a drawing of Paul Paul, the camp of an army led by General uh, Frederick West Lander. And uh, as you can see, it's a very large encampment. This is in February 1864. Lander is trying to get his men ready to go against Stonewall Jackson. On February the 14th, Valentine's Day, Lander will lead his men against the uh, Virginia militia, from, mostly from Berkeley County, that's guarding Bloomery Gap, and he'll win a big victory there. This is General Lander. I consider this to, his death to be maybe more important in the overall scheme of the Civil War than Jackson's advance on, uh, in the Bath Ram Romney campaign. Frederick Jackson West, or Frederick West Lander, excuse me, was a Renaissance man. He was from Salem, Massachusetts. He was a well-known po poet, lecturer. Uh, he had been a transcontinental explorer and railroad builder. He's a uh, uh, road builder, not railroad. And uh, uh, he was married to the beautiful English, English actress Jean Davenport. At the beginning of the Civil War, Lander was not even in the Army, but he was sent on a secret mission by Abraham Lincoln to contact Sam Houston, who was the governor of Texas, to give him a secret message. But he's going to join the Union Army. He's going to be an aide to General McClellan in the Battle of Philippi that West Virginians say was the first battle of the land battle of the Civil War. He's going to make a famous ride during that battle down a mountainside. And uh, a famous poem is going to be uh, immediately pinned about it that goes all over the country. Uh, but Lander had a lot of adventures. He works his way up to where he's a brigadier general. But in the fall of 1862, he receives a slight wound in a battle along the Potomac River at Edward Ferry. Lander is never able to shake this wound. He becomes infected, and even though he has the best of doctors, he's going to end up treating himself with alcohol for the most part. And he always has a fever and so on. But as I said before, he is in Hancock. Later on, he's sent farther west that in, in uh, late January, and he takes command of General Kelly's troops, and he will advance them from near Cumberland to Paul Paul. On March the 3rd, Frederick West Lander is going to die in, in Paul Paul and from the complications of this wound. He had his army ready, and he had planned to march to Winchester and destroy Stonewall Jackson's army, which he may have done. That's why I said it was really a, a blow to the Union Army when he died. He was such an important person nationwide that his, that his funeral, the, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln was there, the whole cabinet was there, General McClellan, and uh, just, just a, a side, there, were, there was a big argument over who would pay for him to for his body and, of course, the funeral party be taken back to Salem, Massachusetts. And the uh, uh, 
federal uh, official in charge of it said, we're not going to do this. We don't, we don't pay for any extra out of our funds. And today, the federal government pays for almost everything. But finally, uh, Secretary of War Stewart uh, put, uh, uh, put him in his place and said the government would pay for it. But a very famous individual in his time, but he's someone who's forgotten today. Okay, Brigadier General John N. Bowden, this is another Paul Paul story on October the 4th, 1862, early in the morning. He will attack the Federals from the 54th Pennsylvania, then uh, a company there at Little Cacapin, the bridge there. He'll take that uh, uh, company quickly and burn the bridge, and then he'll head for Paul Paul next. Now, this is what he wanted to do. He wanted to destroy the Paul Paul Tunnel. Now, the company from the 54th Pennsylvania that was guarding it was uh, led by a man, uh, commanded by a man named Captain John Height. And uh, Height got his men ready. They were in trenches. He was uh, calling, uh, you know, going up to them, are you ready to fight? Are you ready to fight? And they were. They had practiced a lot with their ranges. Uh, and they you know, had everything uh, figured out if, if the enemy hit. But for some s strange reason, when the Confederates came over and offered a truce, J Height would, uh, would surrender his company. And the men were furious. And they led them off to prison in Richmond where they stayed for, stayed for two months before being exchanged. But all the men believed that the reason he did that was because he despised Abraham Lincoln. He was a Democrat from Pennsylvania, and he would sit around the campfire with the other officers and uh, make jokes about Lincoln and make fun of him. But uh, he was upset, really, over the Emancipation Proclamation that, was, that had been uh, not formally issued, but, uh, but there. But this, this all happened in Paul Paul. But you can see you have this tunnel there the Confederates wanted to destroy. They couldn't destroy it because as they were getting ready to, their scouts reported that there was a train full of soldiers headed that way. Okay, 1863 now. Now in 1863, you'll have another exciting year in uh, Morgan County. It'll start off uh, the excitement really in uh, June. And on June the 15th, the Confederate Army, uh, uh, Confederate Second Corps, the Army of Northern Virginia led by Richard Yule will um, chase the Federal Army out of Winchester, led by a man named Robert Milroy. And there'll be a big battle just out, about four miles outside of town at Stevenson Depot. The Con Union Army is defeated, and many of them flood this way, trying to get to Bedford, Pennsylvania. So you have all sorts of accounts from the town of these soldiers passing through, and of course, um, Berkeley Springs was mostly a Union town, and the women running outside uh, uh, with food and drink, and so as these men are passing through, trying to escape the Confederates. Next. One of the Confederates was on this way, is, along the way, was this man, John Hanson McNeil. He's leading about a 50 men that some considered uh, outlaws, and um, but they were called partisan rangers. That meant that they were in the army, but really didn't have to follow all the rules of the army. Anything they captured, they could sell to the, back to the Confederate government or keep for themselves or for, for private sale. On the 17th, he will attack Cherry Run. There's a small group of soldiers there, and uh, there'll be some fighting there. The, uh, uh, he's successful, his men, and. Uh, then he'll continue on to Sleepy Creek and burn the bridge there. He will then go back down river to uh, Williamsport, cross, and then head west towards Clear Spring. On the 19th, on the evening of the 19th, he and his men will arrive at Hancock. Hancock greeted him with open arms. People were cheering when these Confederates rode into town. They were hollering hooray for Jeff Davis and all sorts of things. And uh, they were very happy they were there. They fixed supper for them. And uh, they couldn't believe it. But Hancock was mostly a southern town. They were connected 
by uh, uh, families and, and trade to the south, and they were happy these raiders were there. Fixed them a big uh, lunch or big uh, supper. The next morning, they, uh, before they left to come back across the river uh, to Alpine Depot, they would uh, fix some breakfast. And before the Confederates rode off, he lined his men up in the, in the uh, along Main Street and uh, gave, gave the townspeople three cheers. And uh, next. Okay, the raiders would then cross the Potomac River and they'll go to Alpine Depot right across from Hancock. They'll destroy it. They'll follow the railroad to Sir John's Run. They'll destroy all company property there. Next. And then they'll go to Great Kikapin and burn that bridge. Afterwards, they'll turn around, go through an old mountain road, and they'll reach Bloomery, where they will combine with uh, uh, John and Bowden and his group. So and Bowden will start moving this way, and he will arrive here with about 1,400 men on uh, June the 24th. The first thing he does when he gets into town is try to find David Hunter Strother. And he will go to Strother's house, knock on the door. He'll be met by Strother's teenage daughter, Emily. And Emily will you know, ask why he's there. And uh, he, he said, I want your father. I want to see your father. He said, well, he's with the army. And he makes a statement. He said, tell him that he always tells people he is fighting for the Union. He said, tell him that we know, meaning we in Virginia, that you are fighting to free the Negro. And uh, then and Bowdoin will ride on. There will be a big camp on the fields out of Hancock. And then in Bowdoin and his men will continue on into southern Pennsylvania on big, big raids, horse stealing raids there, accompanied by um, McNeil. Next. Okay, here's Cherry Run, West Virginia, probably a little bit after the war. Cherry Run, of course, uh, is in many uh, Civil War memoirs, uh, soldiers crossing the ford there, soldiers crossing the ferry, little skirmishes that occur around there. But uh, it will have a, a, a big part in the end of the Gettysburg campaign. Now, on the 13th and 14th of July, 1863, Robert E. Lee and his Army of Northern Virginia are able to get across the Potomac River, and then they will go to around Martinsburg, Bunker Hill, and they will also come out towards Hedgesville. So this in, in the Jared Sound Inwood area. So this army is basically resting after that battle. And they've lost approximately 24 to 25,000 men, either killed, wounded, or captured. So their army is resting. General Kelly, who I mentioned before, has approximately 8,000 men and he receives orders to cross the river at Cherry Run on that ferry and then uh, proceed to Hedgesville and get on the western flank of Lee's army. And he will do that. He'll arrive at Cherry Run, across from Cherry Run on the 15th, and it'll take him about two days to cross because there's very high water. He will uh, make this crossing and proceed to Hedgesville, and over the next few days, there'll be skirmishes in the Shenandoah Valley between Kelly's forces and the Confederates. But Lee sees this, this 8,000-man army out there, as a good uh, opportunity uh, that he can capture it. So they will come up with a plan to advance probably uh, uh, two uh, divisions towards Kelly at Hedgesville and then have another one come around through Back Creek Valley to capture him. Now what does that have to do with Morgan County? 
The Pendleton family had uh, received a word from one of their um, uh, servants who was attending a uh, uh, meeting where the generals were at. He was serving in mint juleps. And what was going to happen? He was all ears while he was there. He was listening. Mrs. Pendleton, the f uh, and that's another first family of Virginia, the Pendletons from the Martinsburg area, that uh, a lot of them were unionists. And uh, she tried to send a servant between the lines. Uh, the Confederates turned him back, but she came up with the idea to send her son, Nathaniel, or they called Nat. And they, she sent him, and he was able to get through. And he told Kelly what was going to happen that evening. Kelly didn't believe him at first, but then he found out by his scouts that it was correct. They picked up a uh, uh, sight of some Confederates in Back Creek Valley. So they're going to escape that night, and they're going to get back across the uh, river next, I think. They're General Kelly. And then they're just going to make it. The Confederates, some of the Confederates follow them, but they're able to get across the river to Cherry Run Ford. Late in his life, or before that, uh, late in his life, he gave an interview just a few weeks before he died, and he, and he told his story to a reporter. And um, many years after the, or some years after the war, when Grant was president, he, he asked Grant if he would uh, appoint this boy to West Point, and he did. And the boy that went to West Point, but he uh, flunked out or quit after two years, and Kelly would say he was like all Southern boys. He was profession, proficient in Latin and Greek, but uh, deficient in English. But uh, this boy would come to Morgan County, Nat Pendleton, and he would run the Morgan County News here for a number of years. And he's buried in Greenwood Cemetery. But just a... Uh, on a side, you know, just an odd story of how this army was saved that would have been captured or destroyed. Next. Okay, one of the most uh, compelling memoirs to read about West Virginia, of a West Virginia Civil War, is this book called The Flying Gray-Haired Yank by a guy named Michael Egan, and Captain Michael Egan. He served here for a time. Uh, near uh, Cherry Run at a place called Back Creek Bridge, but he also served at the uh, uh, watching the Ford at Hancock, and he had two companies there, and when he got to Hancock, he knew, noticed that a lot of smuggling was going on. He noticed a lot of the uh, soldiers were going over in, into Hancock, AWOL, because Hancock was rather a wild town at that time. and. Uh, he tells about how, how he went about stopping smuggling, but the, the biggest problem he had with smuggling was with the women, women passing to and fro and uh, across, the, uh, across the ferry there or across the ford and then coming south, usually carrying medicine. But uh, he served at Hancock, and if you ever get a chance to read that book, it's, it's very interesting. Next. Okay. Here's one of the famous Confederate raiders that completely forgotten about today, but he raided Berkeley Springs. John Corbin Blackford. He's going to leave uh, Winchester on the 5th of, of uh, September, 1863. He will raid Berkeley Springs, a cavalry camp south of town, two cavalry camps south of town, and get about 75 horses. But another part of the mission was to capture David Hunter Strother. And George Hunter, who I mentioned before from Berkeley Springs, from this area, tries to get into town to capture him. Fortunately for Struther, he is able to wake up and find out something happens. It's happening, he's, and he's able to uh, get his clothes on and get to the top of Warm Springs Ridge before the Confederates to, could catch him. But he's, he is furious that this happens because it was a large contingent, two, two companies of cavalry just south of town, and they just scattered when the Confederates hit them. Confederates got 75 horses, a number of weapons, and, uh, and a few prisoners. And a few days later, uh, uh, 
Struther will also uh, have a court martial here. He'll be the presiding officer of court martial and uh, or an inquiry. And uh, you know, he, he blasts many of the officers because what had happened with this 20th Pennsylvania Cavalry, most of them had ran and, and the officers led the way. He called one uh, during the trial an arrogant coward and a jackass. So that's what, uh, when this happened. Okay, 1864. This is a map showing uh, probably the most important thing uh, that happened during this time in this whole area at the Confederate burning of Chambersburg on uh, July 30th, 1864. Uh, what had happened? Uh, there had been a lot of uh, burning back and forth during the summer of 1864. Uh, the uh, Union Army, one Union Army under David Hunter, uh, uh, Struthers' cousin, and also Struther was with him as an aide, uh, burned Lexington, Virginia. Uh, they burned some uh, t uh, houses in the Shenandoah Valley. So when, uh, around Jefferson County. So when the um, Confederates got a chance to pay them back, they were going to do it. Uh, next. Okay, here's John McCausland, and um, uh, really tough man. He goes with about 1,800 men to Chambersburg, a cavalry contingent, and he will uh, demand 100, and this is an order from Jubal Early that he's following, $100,000 in gold or $500,000 in cash. The people at first, they say he is, uh, thought he was kidding and they're not going to pay. They couldn't have paid anyway because the bankers had already taken the money out of town. So in about four hours, over 200 structures, about 250 structures in Chambersburg are burned to the ground. But when he's making his escape, he's coming back this way. He's going through McConnellsburg, and he arrives near Hancock. And he, we have an example here at Hancock of one of the first, maybe the first fight between an armored train and Confederate artillery. There's an armored train on the other side uh, at Alpine Depot, and they engage the Confederates for a while until the Confederates luckily uh, shoot the smokestack off the engine and it has to back out, out of the way. But an armored train was setting over uh, <coughs> near, uh, just across the river from Hancock in Morgan County. And then the, then the Confederates move on. But there's not too, too much going on in this county. Now we're going back up to the picture of Trip O'Farrell in later life. Once again, I said he came to um, uh, Morgan County, he was the uh, uh, county clerk elected of Morgan County. He was elected when he was 17 years old, four years before he could even vote. But he went and joined the Confederate Army. Now, in March, on March 19th, 1863, 1864, he and about 20 other men are going to come in to, to, to Berkeley Springs and they're going to raid a meeting of the Union League, people that supported the Union, supported President Lincoln. They're going to be successful. They're going to take the horses and make a great getaway. This is going to cause a lot of trouble after the war, which we'll talk about in a few minutes as these raiders come in. But this, the picture of O'Farrell was one when he was probably governor of Virginia. Okay, 1865, of course, the war's winding down. Not hardly anything going on in this area except maybe a little smuggling. You have the Confederate Army is trapped near Petersburg, Virginia, and uh, besides of a few ca cavalry units in the Shenandoah Valley, there's really not a lot going on here. The war is going to end that April, but for the most part in these border counties, it's not going to continue as a fighting war, but it's going to continue by people getting revenge. This is an old photograph you see in all the books of you know, a Union soldier and an old Confederate soldier shaking hands. This is 40 years after the war. 
If you lived in Morgan County, in 1865, 1866, 1867, and if you had been a union supporter, and if you had been robbed, or your horses had been taken, or some of your other livestock had been taken, cattle, <coughs> you wanted to get even. And the best way to get even was to get even in the courts. Because as the Confederates came back, they did not have any civil rights. So they couldn't defend themselves in court. They couldn't hold public offices and so on. That wouldn't uh, happen in this, in this state until the 1871-72. So take this example of uh, over here at the, when O'Farrell and his men came into this meeting, small meeting, 10, 15 men, some of them escaped. But O'Farrell you know, captured three of those guys, and he took them to Richmond. They were a couple months or to, before they got back home. They wanted to get even. So what did they do? They, t they took them to court and sued them. As I said before, <coughs> O'Farrell never returned here to live. He stayed in Virginia and later became governor. But a lot of these men came back, and they were going to be uh, taken to court, and they were going to lose lose their uh, uh, property to pay for some of these uh, uh, things. Also, during the war, some of them lost their property because they hadn't been here to pay taxes. So these hard feelings will continue on after the war for many years. Okay. Some say, you know, uh, even some of this horse stealing that had originated in Pennsylvania carried on here for another 12 years after the war. But, of course, they weren't taking them to an army. They were just stealing them and selling, selling them to other places. But the Confederates couldn't defend themselves. Ex-Confederates could, couldn't. But <clears throat> when West Virginia's new constitution went into effect, uh, the ex-Confederates and then some of the people that had grudges against the uh, Republican founders of West Virginia got, got their power back in the state, and then everything settled down. But this is a small community. Remember, there's only 3,800 people or so here at the beginning of the war. So everyone knew one another or were some way related. And so these grudges continued many years after the war, not like these, you know, these guys, this is 40 years later. Now, if you were in Georgia or Tennessee or someplace where most of the people had been Confederate, there wasn't too many problems there. But in a border, in a border state or border county, as Morgan was, you had a lot of problems, a lot of bad feelings. So that's about all I have for today. Well, thanks a lot for your time. I have some books up here if anyone's interested. A lot of them have stories from Morgan County. And I uh, appreciate it, and thanks a lot. <laughs>